there are people, you know, including just, you know, normal everyday people who are engaging in solutions. And I think the more the awareness grows, um, we there's agitation for change right now and there's change happening now. Um, we need it to happen rapidly because, you know, the survival of humanity is at stake. And I know that sounds super dramatic, but it is literally the truth right now. And, you know, we see the toll of the climate crisis unfolding in front of us. We see the toll of plastic pollution. We see the toll of, of toxins. Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater and athlete, and I will be your host to facilitate these conversations. Now that at the beginning was Erica Serino, a science writer, author, artist, and communications manager of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Erica's work focuses a lot around the plastic crisis and how it's affecting us. She's chronicled her work in her new book, Thicker Than Water, which explored solutions to our plastic problem so guess what we're talking about today? Yeah, plastic. The past, present, and future, including the opportunities and the dangers. So it's definitely one, uh, it's great for a one-on-one if you're wanting like a, a beginner's guide to why this is actually even a problem. But then we're gonna talk about different solutions and ways we can tackle this, which will be really important to kind of digest in terms of information. I really enjoyed this conversation with Erica, so I hope you do as well. With all that being said, I will see you guys on the other side. Erica, welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast. How are you going? Doing well, thanks, Tom. How are you? Doing so good, thank you. Um, so we've got two of us on the screen, but we've got three people, which someone might kind of hear. What was his name? Lenny? Sabi. 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 We've got yeah. Sabi jumping in the background because <laughs> dogs are just excited and that's life. And we're going to excuse the little bumps and jumps so everyone can know during this conversation, someone else in the room is having the time of their life. Definitely. <laughs> so I'm really excited for today's conversation. Um, plastic is a pretty big uh, topic, I think, for everyone in different and varying degrees. Some people just avoid it without knowing why exactly but it's one of those things where other people are starting to do it so I'm like I think it's bad I don't know why exactly it is um you know I've become plastic phobic for maybe two years now uh, around that time what kind of got you onto the issue it started a long long time ago really um I was 15 years old and I was working as a wildlife rehabilitator and that was like my first real job <laughs> It, it was mostly very unglamorous and included like cleaning cages and um, taking care of sick, injured and orphaned wild animals, which is a very messy and sometimes dangerous operation. But to me, as someone who's always loved nature and wildlife um, growing up in a kind of a woodsy area and spending so much time outside, to me, that was like the most rewarding thing I could do with my life. Oh, now our companion is eating her dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Again, animals are, are just yeah. a theme in my life. Um, but being a young person and growing up in, I'm 30 years old and grew up primarily, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. And that was a period of rapid plastic production, mm -hmm. um, if we look at the numbers. And back then, you know, I saw that translated into like basically everything that we used was wrapped in plastic. You know, I thought today I was like, whatever happened to Gogurt? <laughs> Like we were literally just sucking plastic, uh, sorry, yogurt out of plastic tubes and there's, you know, plastic in our clothing and everything. And I was just realizing as a teenager, being conscious of the environment and someone who loves nature, just, wow, there's a lot of plastic all around. And then it translated into my job as, okay, we're going out today to rescue a great horned owl, which is this gorgeous owl with these bright yellow eyes. Um, that's flown into a soccer net and gotten completely entangled and actually is dead because it's just been totally mangled by this net. And like soccer nets are made out of plastic, but I didn't think about that until I went out to rescue 10 great horned owls in the span of seven years or so. Um, you know, there are um, animals that get hit by cars and car tires are of course made out of synthetic rubber, which is plastic. Um, we had animals that ingested plastic, got 
trapped in it. You know, there is the the list is endless, and it was very upsetting to see that these were problems, including plastic, but also many other issues like having animals being poisoned and whatnot, um, preventable. So I'm fast forwarding now. I know that I'm spending a long time on this story, but I am getting to the point. And that is that when I um, went to college and I started studying, I wanted to kind of further my rehabilitation work and maybe become a biologist or ecologist or someone working outside with animals all the time, which I really love to do. But I took a course in environmental literature and that course, you know, I was reading uh, Sandra Stein Graber and Rachel Carson, um, Robert Bullard, and many other people who brought attention to um, environmental, environmental justice issues. And the wildlife part of that just kind of always ran strong for me. And I knew that I needed to start writing about or communicating the problem, writing just being a medium that I really love, um, and also art with my photography, but communicating these issues. And specifically, I landed on plastics because that's just been something that you know, noticing it everywhere, noticing the toll it had on wildlife, it always stuck with me. Um, and it really touches every single person. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into the, mm. the scale and scope of the issue, but for now, I'll just leave it at that. And so that is my <laughs> long, short story about how I got into uh, the plastic issue. Yeah, that's that's very cool because it's something – I love hearing the different stories because some way or another – you know, plastic is a huge part of our lives and a lot of people can go their whole lives without realizing the issue it creates. And you definitely saw that firsthand having gone and seeing these animals, these beautiful creatures entangled in what humans have created to a point where they've actually, um, their life has been taken from them. And, And that's when it really causes like a bit of an uproar to say, this is, this is an issue. Um, of, of varying degrees and I'm glad that you kind of took that and you're like well th- there is maybe something I can do about it but to preface the conversation and to kind of zoom out a little bit how do you I'd love for you to give a quick one-on-one on plastic and why exactly it is even a problem okay so why is plastic a problem um it is ubiquitous. Um, over time, humans have produced more than 8.5 billion metric tons of plastic, which it's not even a comprehensible number. That's how large it is. Um, and we're pumping out plastics right now at a rate of 400 million metric tons a year. So the important part of that, know that it's an astronomically large amount of plastic and barely any of it is actually recycled. And most of it is actually just pushed f- further away from wherever it was disposed. Um, So say you put your plastics in your recycling bin, even though you've recycled as an individual, the industry that makes and sells plastic and also deals with plastic at the end of its life cycle and the disposal side of things and says that it's being recycled, will ship it overseas to often to countries in the global south um, where it causes widespread pollution and, and injustice. Excuse me. Sabi? I'm talking about something very serious. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a dire issue in in nations in the global south where mm. you know especially the U.S. we produce the most amount of plastic and other waste in the world. We're the biggest wasters, um, and so much of our garbage is sent to other countries, and that's just yeah. completely unfair. First of all, um, and then second of all, you know, plastic is producing pollution up and down the pipeline, so we don't even have to think about. Um, we have to think about the, the far reaching consequences and we don't often do that. So, you know, shipping waste is one aspect of this. So it's, again, plastic is not going away. It's going on the shoulders of someone else, some, mm-hmm. somewhere else. And yeah. um, often that is to communities of color, rural and low income people, um, and those groups that are most underserved in our society today in other ways. So it's, it's really exacerbating a lot of systemic issues like racism and classism, especially in the U.S., but also all around the world. And so that is a big aspect of it. And then there's the toxicity portion. So plastics are manufactured with tens of thousands of proprietary chemicals. And so many of these are extremely toxic. And, you know, it, it's almost every day that a new study is coming out and uh, shedding light on just the range of consequences. So, you know, everything from uh, reproductive harm and, and harming our growth to causing cancer and causing immune problems. I mean, the 
the disgusting toll of plastics is like completely endless. And we're even seeing um, patterns of like, you know, high asthma rates and plastic particles now are all around us. And you start thinking, okay, there's a study that came out that said plastic is in our lungs. It's in our bloodstream. Um, it is inside our bodies. And these particles, actually, Tom, I'll show you since we're on video. So just hold on a second. But it's it's nice to show people what this is. Um, so think of like any plastic item. And this is what it will eventually break up into. Plastic never breaks down. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. And these you can still see, but the particles that enter our bloodstreams. We call these micro and nanoplastics. Um, okay, so they contain those toxins that we just discussed, which just to name a few of them, BPA, phthalates, um, PFAS, which are these forever chemicals that are found in nonstick um, cookware and also in like mm -hmm. rain gear, clothing. And as someone who, you know, goes outside a lot and has like, you know, waterproof jackets, that's like very scary to think that I've been like coating my body in toxic chemicals all these years. But anyway, these particles, um, when they are ingested or inhaled, um, or even, you know, maybe absorbed into our bodies, mm. um, we don't know exactly what harm it's causing to humans right now, but we can correlate these toxins with these different health conditions that they're known to cause. Mm. Um, but we also do know that wildlife are, like so badly affected by microplastics and also by plastic items. So um, that is the rundown. It affects, plastic affects everything. It really does. And it also touches all of us, as I said. So. Yeah. There's so many different ways There's I can so take them. So I plan to take them to potentially all of them, but firstly, just to preface. So for those just on audio, firstly, get your butts on YouTube so you can watch this. But well, secondly, yes. she was holding up a jar of microplastic. So was, what, what was that roughly like 250, 500 mil uh, jar? Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, it's scary to look at the size of that when you think of those studies and, and like the saying, like we ingest a, uh, a credit card's worth of microplastic a week and certain things like that it really puts it into perspective, the physical element of that. But, but totally. you touched on the racial side of things, and that's something I find super fascinating because I think it sometimes it isn't, but most times it can be. I want to explore that a little bit. Like, and, and just before I get you to take the stage there, it, it's interesting because in Australia, let's say I'll truck loads of plastic that end up in the ocean due to just littering and, and bad management ends up in countries like Indonesia, Philippines. Um, Papua New Guinea, these nations that don't have the facilities to dispose of that effectively. And then we create this insanely toxic environment and nobody's held responsible because you right. don't know where it's come from. There's no barcode by the time it comes there. It could look like something that's degraded. It could look, there's no responsibility there. So I want you to take the stage on why exactly this can be a racial issue. Right. So Thank you for bringing up that like it's hard to trace where this plastic comes from because that's a big aspect of it is that a lot of this waste business is very secretive and very um, non-transparent, which adds to that um, lack of understanding, even though frontline communities all over the world have been facing these issues since plastics were first mass produced in the 1940s. And, you know, it's only gotten worse as plastic production has increased. And so when plastics are shipped overseas or to another nation, um, it's not always by ocean. It's sometimes by rail or by truck or by train. Oh, sorry, I said that already. <laughs> rail and train are the same. Uh, anyway, but uh, we have frontline communities that are often um, lower income or communities of color. And these communities are often apart from those wealthier richer, often whiter places where, um, you know, not in my backyard prevails. And so it's, it's really cheap and easy for businesses to say, okay, I'm going to ship my waste to um, a community of color because there are no protections in place to, to help mm. these communities. In fact, zoning laws, and, and I'm speaking again from, uh, I mean, the U.S., but in the U.S. and globally, there is a lack of protections, but specifically in the U.S., um, zoning rules have been racist for a very long time. And it's like, we have to really look back in history and see how did we get here? Because, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, there's pollution everywhere. It's like, yes, but when you look at, you know, 
the vast majority of disposal sites and also um, production sites of plastic being located in these communities that have been long underserved. There is a pattern here and there's a reason. It's a, it's a long legacy of these issues happening. And I think mm-hmm. um, the more that we look in history to see how did we get here, the better, because how are we going to undo the problems? You know, we need to implement protections. We also need to remediate and aid frontline communities in, in getting solutions. So, yeah, that's um, that, that's a great topic. I think we need to all talk about a little bit more. And I wanted to sidestep there to another thing you did mention, which is um, well, we've got two other really vital topics that you mentioned, which is the effect to the animals and the environment. I'll, they might be two separate ones, but I'll pair them together for now. And the effect on humans. So like you said, we're wearing it, um, we're eating it, it's in our lungs, it's in our bloodstream, it's in our organs, it's affecting our reproductive system. And it's something, What I, I, I'm going to give humans a little bit of a slack here because we haven't <laughs> known that for too long. Um, I think once it really tackles, like I think the study you were talking about, which is the pl- uh, plastic entering our lungs, like that wasn't that long ago that this was actually conducted. And when right. we even look at the study of microplastics um, affecting our reproductive system, we're looking back. At, uh, the oldest I've seen that was a good quality study was 2013. So right. not even 10 years from now. And I think, you know, if, if the effect, because we've known the effect of plastic on the environment for a while, it's not, it's something that's been exacerbated in the past few years, maybe decade or so. But once, selfishly, I think once humans figure out it's affecting them, and reproductive system, and now it's linked to smaller uh, penis or genial size, and it's affecting um, miscarriages. So these types of things, I think, are really going to shift humans away from it. But where where do you kind of sit on making sure it doesn't affect you? Like, what do you do? Oh, what do I do? Um, I've tried most recently to build a plastic-free home. And... Um, that was really hard. And it was actually for me, I couldn't afford to not use plastic because it is so cheap and widely available. And due to my budget, you know, I have a few things that are plastic, but they're things that are not uh, outward facing inside the home. As you can see, it's a lot of wood. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's as little plastic as possible. And I also chose um, energy sources that can be converted one day to something more sustainable like solar. Currently I'm hooked up to the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. Um, Solar is not perfect either because we have silicons and plastics and solar panels and also metals that are mined in horrific ways that destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. And it is again, like, what do we do? What do we do? But um, I think we just have to all try our best and I reuse and refill. Um, I refuse plastic as much as I can. I don't ever take, like take away in plastic or anything like that. Um, I just, if I can't get it without plastic, I usually go without or I'll try to make stuff myself. Um, I cook a lot at home. I shop, you know, locally when I can and try to, um, you know, frequent like farmer's markets or go to farms and and get food that way. Um, Buying in bulk is a great way to minimize your plastic exposure and and use of plastic. and people often ask me like, oh, what products do I need to buy? And it's like, I literally just save every like jam jar that I purchase um, and just fill it up with like leftovers or drinks mm. or whatever. And it's, you know, you don't look, you can look pretty hipster when you do that, honestly, but <laughs> it's, a thing you don't now. To, it's a thing now. And uh, like just being mindful of like how much I use, um, I think is a big part of my life and my, my practice is just keeping that footprint as low as possible and thinking about who I I might be harming by Mm -hmm. the actions that I'm taking, because, you know, I'm hurting animals by cutting down wood for my home, but I'm also, I need a shelter as a, as a living being. Like it's, we can get into a very, very (laughs) tangled web of like guilt and bad feelings. And I never shame anyone for using plastic because honestly, in some places, um, often again, communities of color, rural and low-income areas, sometimes the only affordable food you can get is wrapped in plastic. And it's like, we can't shame anyone and we can't shame communities that use plastic. Um, But what we need to look at is like, who is making the plastic? And then we see, okay, there's the petrochemical and plastic industries. Um, And going back to the energy source for my home, like I'm 
refusing petrochemicals because I don't want to keep facilitating the creation of plastics, which is so tightly linked. And as we move into the future where, you know, the climate crisis is just so dire and so like, you know, an emergency, we should be all like looking at a siren every day. I feel like, <laughs> like a red siren. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is so important to realize these interconnections and then plastics and climate being, um, you know, best friends, basically climate crisis and plastic. Um, because the more plastics that's created, the more petrochemicals that will be extracted from the planet, um, and an immense amount of energy is required to uh, refine and make plastic. So I know there's a lot of information, everyone, but <laughs> we we need to like go on this deep dive and notice like it's not just like a like a material. It's like this is a whole landscape built mm -hmm. by plastic that we've we've created. 100%. Now, I like what you touched on, which I didn't realize for a long time. Like, I think I started going pl away from plastic. I didn't know why, and I didn't know where it came from. So you think, like, you grow a fruit. You're like, oh, it comes from a tree. I'm like, where do you grow plastic? And for a long time, I didn't realize that plastic is petroleum and, and just in a physical form that should be refined. And then we can look at, you know, 3 to 4%, depending on the figure you look at, of all fossil fuels are, are devoted to plastic. And so that's how we can link climate change and plastic use, not not including the shelf life of plastic and how it actually right. affects the environment in, you know, in the great Pacific garbage patch and all of that. So I think connecting that is really important because I think a lot of people don't realize, and that's, that's exactly why we say it's bad for health because, it, you know, what happens? How do you make these polymers? Well, it's, it's a process of refinement that includes heat. And so if you're having a tea in a plastic cup, that, that plastic is going to start leaching out because it's not a physical form. It's just liquid that's been solidified or, or a gas that's been solidified. And so I think once we realize that connection, so I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, it's, it makes it ever more reasonable to think and logical to think, okay, that is why it's harming them. No one's sitting at the petrol station with their car, be like, some for the car, some for me, some for the car, some for me. But yet that's what we do. Literally, yes. Wow. That's, uh, it's, that's a really funny analogy. I'm just thinking of that. But uh, it's alarming to think that, you know, we've been going along our lot, like most of our lives, most of us who are adults right now, um, just, you know, oh, a plastic cup, a plastic fork, a spoon. And there, there have been people early on who have, um, you know, kind of rung the alarm bells, but the vast majority of people have not given plastics a second thought. I mean, they're so normalized. Um, but when you break it down that way, I love that <laughs> you got to start talking to people in that way. Like you're drinking out of a cup made out of, you know, gasoline. <laughs> like, mm. would you really like to do that? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting material for sure. Yeah, and I think what's really cool about that perspective is like you mentioned, you know, the industry in all facets of life, including political avenues, have, have an influence. And once you realize, you think of how powerful the petrochemical industries are in terms of their lobbying power and influence amongst our politicians, you think, well, plastic has to do with that as well. So much like with everything else, if you're purchasing a plastic product, whatever that may be, you're inherently, which which is really hard because like you mentioned before, and I totally agree, it's really hard to avoid plastic. You're, you're voting for this, this corrupt industry. Um, and, and to kind of circle back to what you were saying earlier, the best and worst thing about plastic or the biggest pro to plastic is also the biggest con, which is it lasts bloody forever. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's a real shame. And expanding on that point, we have now, thanks to technology and a, a few key companies and more and more coming out, we have alternatives to plastics, such as a uh, bioplastic plant-based plastics. Now I haven't actually looked at the viability economically, how they actually pair up next to plastic. Have you ever d done that deep dive? Yeah, I mean, I work now with uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition, which is really exciting. So this is a group that has been working for decades to bring attention to the truths about plastic. And so many of the studies that you see that say, oh, plastic is cheaper than paper, or it has a lower impact than, 
um, you know, if you washed all of your plates and cups, like I think I saw like a restaurant analysis once where it was like advocating for plastic plates and, wow. and flatware. And, that. and then you like look at who funded that study. And then you're like uh, the American <laughs> Chemical um American Chemistry Council or um, the uh, Plastic Industry Association. And you're just kind of like piecing these things together. And actually a huge part, I'm so sorry for my dog being so crazy today. <laughs> I Let's all take a like, little bit of his happiness. I'm going into another room. Savi, I'm so sorry, but you're <laughs> excommunicated from the podcast. Um, so just to go off that point is that we need to be clear about... Um, you know, the idea that a lot of the information um, out there about plastics has been um, kind of skewed by the industry. And mm -hmm. we can even look at things like their tactics. So there's um, distraction, deflection, um, and then misinformation. And they the industry does this. And it's very hard to, by the way, like point out who is a part of the industry, like who, like with a name on it, um, mm -hmm. because there are so many people working in it. But I think that that is kind of the next step that we need to be taking is calling people out because um, Greenpeace is actually doing a great job of that in the sense that they're calling out uh, businesses that belong to trade groups in the industries. And so the industries are vet trade groups are vast. They are very either very wide and vast or they're very specific. So mm -hmm. there's like the plastic mold makers of America or like, you know, like things like mm -hmm. that to like plastic industry association, which claims that it represents the full um, so-called life cycle of plastics. And so these groups, these trade industry associations and other groups, um, they'll create like green sounding nonprofits. Um, mm -hmm. Keep America beautiful is probably the most famous of all of them, but there are several others that have a very green sheen and we call this greenwashing where um, like an industry making an inherently uh, toxic and unjust and um, just generally bad product that is marketed as something that's helpful. is just a lie. And so they're just selling lies and then they are putting, you know, confusing consume. I don't want to use the word consumers. I hate that word, by the way, Con confusing the public um, in thinking like, oh, well, they're doing more recycling or um, they're telling us that we should go and participate in a cleanup. And of course, these are not real solutions. These are just band-aids that don't really do anything. Um, and meanwhile, doing this weird psychological game where people are kind of gaslit, uh, it's just to use psychology terms here, but they're gaslit into thinking, oh, no, I'm part of the problem if I don't recycle or if I don't uh, mm. clean up. But in reality, it's like the industry that pumps out this product is culpable. Um, so this huge mismatch and getting to that point where we can just say like, hello, this is not the truth. This is, <laughs> this is a false reality. Like that's where we need yeah. to be. Yeah. It's fascinating how they try to really shift the blame to consumer. And we've seen that amongst almost every single uh, industry and political lobbying group where, well, you can't, like in Australia, we have, you know, a few big activism groups that try to stop new coal and gas projects. And they do that by surfing out to where they're going to frack, like on their surfboards. And a big criticism they had is, well, the surfboards you use are made from plastics. The clothes you wear are made from plastics. And it's funny how they fully shifted that, that blame, but yeah. Obviously, to, to tackle it, it's a really funny story before I continue on. The next time they went out, they went in fully bamboo surfboards and naked. Okay. So they couldn't okay. say anything. So it was a group of like 50 surfers that went out butt naked on their bamboo <laughs> boards and then they couldn't say anything. But it, it's funny. And I think the term, I might be wrong, is called astroturfing, where they create a new group, like this great, make it. I keep thinking like Trump, like make America green again or whatever, <laughs> whatever that may be. And it's, it's so, so insane. And it's something out of like a sci-fi novel, how they're literally creating a, a, a group that's meant to be good. Like I know Walmart had this big scandal where they did Walmart family for Americans and it was only the executives on the board and they made this fake story. And it reminds me very much of that, but it's, it's really sad how, 
and, and the shift to black, like, yes, we should recycle. Yes, we should avoid plastic as much as possible. Yes, companies who produce plastic should be held responsible. And I think that's um, that's part of being a democratic, capitalistic society. The fact that we we can hold these companies responsible for where their products come from, how we do that, that's where I'm stumped. Right, right. What like how? <laughs> um, in that vein, and I can't go too deep into this um, because there are lawsuits on the table. Not yeah. that I'm personally bringing right now uh but i just recently was made aware that there are like protections at least in the u.s um for people the public um in consuming products and the federal trade commission is tasks with tasked with creating those standards um i i have a very hard time like believing that there's any enforcement of these standards which include things like um, not having misleading marketing or having words that are are clear and not like meaning something else. And yet mm-hmm. it is allowed to happen because let's think about who subsidizes the fossil fuel industry, governments, especially the government of the U.S. And it's like mm-hmm. there are too many cozy relationships. There's too much corruption. And I think there could be a framework. There could be standards. I think, Tom, like if we made some kind of ethics, you know, around marketing. Like why does that not exist or why is that not mm-hmm. enforced or talked about? Like we do live in a capitalist consumerist society, but we don't have to, you know, consume and allow industries to, you know, rule us, which is essentially what has happened. You know, making tens of billions. I mean, the amount of money, it, like it makes me gasp because I'm like Imagine how many people's lives can be improved with that mm-hmm. amount of money. Like, it's unreal. And at the expense of all of us, and especially the most vulnerable people. So it's a topic that uh, <laughs> I'm very passionate about because it's just, it's like you said, it's like a sci-fi movie. Like, how has this occurred? Yeah, and not a good sci-fi movie, probably in the category of dystopia. Mm. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah. if we're looking at this, like, I'm sure one part of the the solution is to do what kind of Greenpeace does, which is to expose um, and try to hold some sort of uh, legal and justice repercussions for these companies. And even though they're in the pockets of each other, once the, I think, I don't know if you'll agree, but once everyone knows what's happening, and even if like, say, the petroleum industry and the government have this cozy relationship, which they do, if the consumers are then aware of all the corruption that is happening. I think the government actually has to do something about that. Otherwise, yes. at the end of the day, politicians want us in their corner. So I think there's one doing a job there, but secondly, it's part of educating the masses on on all things. So the fact that plastics come from petroleum, how it affects the environment, how it affects our health. Have you thought about how to most efficiently educate everyone about this topic or, or how someone can educate themselves? Yeah. um, Well, a great thing to do would be to visit Plastic Pollution Coalition's website because we do have um, facts clearly laid out for people to understand and and different media for people to engage in. So um, there's a great like uh, playlist of webinars, for example, and you can, you know, meet Dr. Shana Swan, who discovered that um, the chemicals in plastics are causing major fertility issues. Mm. And I'm in one of the webinars, too, talking about my book and uh, that has more of an environmental justice focus. So there's to to understand the nuance, you really need to invest the time. Um, but I think increasingly the resources are available. I mean, I could shout out a million great resources, which if you don't mind, if I do, I would be happy to <laughs> give it, give us like a good five, just go for it. Just run a few of your favorites. Plastic pollution coalition. Cause now nah, I work there. So <laughs> I'll do that one first. Um, I love Anja Krieger's uh, plastosphere pod which is an amazing podcast um, that really worked to shed a lot of light on the issue in the past um, several years, which was really exciting to see. And then um, Shilpi Childroy's um, People Over Plastics podcast, which is um, a newer but, you know, similar vein of like, let's get to the truth here. And she's, you know, shared some amazing stories there. Um, 
on Twitter, I love Lego Lost at Sea, who has a new book out <laughs> um, and goes to beaches in the UK and just finds so much plastic stuff. And it's almost like I'm no longer on Twitter um, for just, you know, mental health reasons. But if mm -hmm. you're on Twitter, please check out Lego Lost at Sea. Oh, and then who else? Oh, um, watch the film The Story of Plastic, which is a really fantastic documentary that covers the you know, whole scope of the issue. So there's five. <laughs> mm. But I mean, again, uh, there's so much to see and, and engage with. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to mention, because we mentioned the government having to act side, um, here is some encouraging news because I know that this topic is so, so heavy. <laughs> um, but in the state of California, in the U.S., um, Rob Bonta, who is um, a lawmaker there, he's kind of forced this lawsuit forward um, where ExxonMobil and other petrochem petrochemical companies, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice right now. Um, they are being investigated for their culpability in the plastic mm -hmm. crisis and in the widespread pollution of our environment. Um, and so that is occurring in California because I think, uh, you know, California has this reputation of being a state that is very progressive on environmental mm -hmm. issues. And it is true that many of the residents um, of California do push forward um, on these issues and and that matters and so it's like we need to be active in our political process as you know tricky as that can mm -hmm. be and i think a lot of people um where i live got turned off in the past four years to being involved they just kind of mm -hmm. checked out <laughs> they were like nope um so we do have to return to our political process and i mean even just starting in your own community mm -hmm. um with your local lawmakers can be super important um and can 100%. even save lives hundred yep. percent. Um, I, I love the story. I've, I've read a fair bit about California and, and where they're kind of going. And, and I understand because they've actually had a few incidents over the past five years or so where they've had, um, oil rigs kind of do a fair bit of damage in their ecosystem. They've actually found is getting impacted quite heavily. So I can understand why they're coming out. And I think it was not even, not even six months ago, they had uh, an oil spill off the coast of California and they couldn't even go on the beaches. They were doing a mad, massive cleanup. So I understand why they're pushing such an agenda considering the marine ecosystem around California is absolutely incredible. And some creatures you can find that you can't find in any other place in the world that we know of. So I'm glad that they're really taking a jump for it. And, and on the political front, definitely something I, I never really thought of when I was like 18, 19, but you know, now that I'm 25, 26, however old I am, I've forgotten on the spot. <laughs> but you, you, as you get older, I think you really realize the importance of voting. And, you know, in, in Australia, for example, it's compulsory to vote here. So as soon as you're over 18, um, you got to vote. And the, the danger of that is you and the op it's a beautiful opportunity in danger it's both sides is one you can do like your your phony votes where you don't you just tick random boxes you don't know what you're voting for and that's that's really not healthy and in america i implore everyone to vote because i know it's not compulsory there but you, you can't complain about the situation you're in if you don't give your voice power and that's one of the beautiful things you're allowed to do in a, in a democratic state and system so I definitely just wanted to add that in. I add that in as much as possible Thanks, whenever yeah. I can. Um, but I want to also, I want to uh, say one more piece of good news before I um, move on, since you said some good news. I think New South Wales, which is one of our bigger states in Australia, um, as of they're doing a two stage implementation process, but one in June, one in November. Um, and then that'll be the last place in Australia that I believe can have single-use plastic bags, straws, wow. containers. So I think after that, Australia will be fully um, plastic-free, which is awesome news as well. Yay! Yeah, Australia, that's amazing. Cool. Yes. Not not that we don't have our own demons and devils and whether that gets implemented is another story, but so far, so good. There are people, you know, including just, you know, normal everyday people who are engaging in solutions. And I think the more the awareness grows, um, we – there's agitation for change right now and there's change happening now. Um, we need it to happen rapidly because, you know, the survival of humanity is at stake. And I know that sounds super dramatic, but it is literally the truth right now. And, you know, we see the toll of the climate crisis unfolding in front of us. We see the toll of plastic pollution. We see the toll of, of toxins 
um, everywhere and over development. And I mean, it's just the list goes on and on the basics. So I would say reusable shopping bags, for example, like think about your daily habits and then where is the plastic showing up? So most of us have to go shopping. Most of us have to eat <laughs> in our homes and um, just getting especially in our, what we eat and our and our foodware and our um, kitchens, like getting plastic out of there is a big source of plastic in our bodies. So that's really a great thing to do. Um, I covered a story in 2019 about microplastics in our indoor air. And at that time, that was before the lung study that came out and actually found it definitive, definitively in lungs, um, human lungs. But at that time, the scientists said, you know, we're breathing in at least 11 particles of microplastic per hour. Some of that might be expelled when we exhale, but mm -hmm. clearly some is contained. So um, just getting rid of, you know, synthetic like pillows and blankets and um, anything that's made out of plastic that's a, a carpet, for example, um, and replacing that with renewable natural materials like wood, stone, um, ceramic, even uh which is not the best, but it's better than, than plastic. But I think um, be aware too of like the finishes that you use in your home or the different types of adhesives. Like I've, I've learned so much in the process of building a house because it's like you can smell the VOCs or the volatile organic compounds that are in a lot of like plastic based products. Mm. And you can almost do like a smell test and be like, oh, that's plastic and it's nasty. I don't want that in my house. Um, because those are off-gassing chemicals and and particles, of course, are shedding off of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also with our clothing, that's another big source. And I buy a lot of secondhand clothes. And I think it's possible to find things that are um, natural materials, especially in like vintage shops, because you think about it and like many decades back, not too many, but quite a few, um, you know, there was no plastic and there was not a big prevalence of plastic in our clothing, um, even maybe like, let's say 40, 50 years ago, it was much less um, ubiquitous than it is today. So search for, you know, natural clothing materials, um, you know, and try to just reuse as much as you can um, in terms of like non-toxic uh, renewable products like glass, metal, paper. Um, that's what we got to do. And we got, I mean, it's, it's funny because all, I've traveled all over and Everywhere I've gone, people have shared their plastic free stories with me. And I'm never like I'm always shocked by the ingenuity of people. And I'm like by now, I'm not surprised by like, oh, yeah, I just I go to the, the bakery and I had a tea towel and I wrap my bread and I carry it home. And like some people will be like, wow, that sounds so annoying. And I'm like, it's really not like it's a it's literally mm. habit. And I think it's an interesting thing to look at, like plastic in terms of addiction because I think when we when we get so used to convenience, and this is something I learned when I was sailing, it's like life was not meant to be convenient. And we're humans and we're animals and we're meant to like be busy and be doing things and trying to survive. And then it's like plastic eliminated a lot of um, extra labor that we have to do. And I mean, I'm thinking about things like, you know, plastic water bottles, like you just throw a bunch in your bag or in your car and then you're ready to go. And don't do that, please, because <laughs> you're going to get like warm plastic particles uh, in your water. But anyway, um, yeah, it's just like when we slow down and think about how we should be living deliberately, um, it's much easier to find ways to eliminate that plastic. because It's almost like, OK, like, let me just think out the process. What do I need to do to to get there? But often mm -hmm. the solutions are very, very simple. Often they're very cheap. And again, um, you know, simple as reusing like a jam jar. For, for putting some food in or, or your water. So hundred percent. And you know, everyone, I love all of those and everyone has their unique set of, um, problems that they, they try to tackle. So we can in Australia have just a normal, um, uh, metal drinking bottle. And I have this, and what I found was really struggling is when you open it up, sometimes I found that they were lined with plastic on the inside and right. this has a little plastic compartment and I, I really struggled to find one that didn't, but I'm thinking it doesn't really touch my water and it's right. still insulated. So I know it won't leach into the water, but there's different solutions for different people. So not every country or not every person can go up to a tap like you in Australia and most places in America, besides what is it? Uh, Flint, Michigan that has the, the oh, yeah. water. Yeah. So yeah. that's a big plastic problem. 
Um, but there's solutions like like a Lark bottle. I'm not sure if you heard of. They've got this U- UV on the inside that can clean out, and that's just an example with plastic bottles. Nice. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can go about it, and I love it. And you mentioned something, which is when you were out sailing, and you oh. actually went out to search for microplastics. Is that right? Yeah. So in 2016, I was invited as a photojournalist to go uh, across the garbage patch, <laughs> a part of it, at least the eastern part of it, from L.A. to Hawaii. And I went with a group of Danish sailors and scientists and the American artist Chris Jordan, who um, he's well known for his photographs of albatrosses, which are these magnificent mm. seabirds. Um, and their bodies are completely packed with plastic stuff. And it's just yep. the most disturbing image you'll ever see. And especially when you hear that these images are are real and they are literally just dead birds that he found and cut open um and they are gorging themselves on plastic and the parents are feeding the babies plastic and if you want to learn more about that i can talk about that a different time but like uh it's just basically what a lot of wild animals are now we're finding attracted to eating plastic because of either the way it tastes or smells um and it's like it's horrible. So anyway, uh, they smells and those, looks if we're looking at turtles and plastic bags, cause they eat jellyfish and exactly, they, the, the mimicry of it, all, all of it. Yeah. And I also want to mention the poor whales because like filter feeding whales, like they just in, ingest so many microplastics with each gulp. Mm. And it's so horrifying to think about that. Uh, I digress, but <laughs> so important to, you know, just keep our eyes on this whole giant toll of plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, going back to the garbage patch, that was a wild trip because at the time, even in 2016, which is not super long time ago, um, you know, I, I was kind of getting the understanding of the impression that like there's this big floating garbage dump and still people who meet me today for the first time. And they ask me like, Oh, what was it like? Was this just like a floating dump of garbage? Like it must've been so weird to see that. I was like, no, it was almost like a clean blue sea. And then suddenly, you know, a lamp or a, um, a tire and like a shampoo bottle would like just float by in rapid succession. And then if you took a close look at the water, you saw all these plastic particles, like I showed you before, mm. um, those microplastics and nanoplastics. And it's really this like soup of plastic stuff that's just constantly shifting and stirring and breaking up and the sunlight out in the ocean mixed with the the temperature and the wind and the waves is just churning it all up into this big confetti like mess uh, mixed with like the larger items that are like freshly um, blown or dumped or rolled into the ocean Um, and rivers too. They, they kind of collect trash as they meander down um, and are also used as dumps in some places. So it's just, we, (laughs) we have a huge issue here, but I think the biggest part of that trip that um, stood out to me was it finally, for me, kind of changed the image of the issue in my mind from like an issue that everyone in my life had like portrayed as like, oh, it's a littering problem or um, an ocean problem. And, and you know, even um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the U.S., which is NOAA, and they kind of mm. oversee a lot of like um, trash related or plastic related science and research Um, especially in the oceans, but they always call it marine debris. And I'm like, it's not marine debris, it's it's plastic pollution. And now I know that, but, you know, up to that point, I think a lot of us kind of thought, okay, is plastic just dumped in the ocean? Like, and there is, to be fair, there is a long history of humanity dumping things they don't want in the ocean. That is true, Mm -hmm. but it's way more complicated than that. So I think cutting through that complexity by sailing into this place and realizing not everything is what it seems was like a parable for the rest of this journey that I ended up taking because, you know, there's so much secrecy. There's so, so many hidden um, agendas in this story and we are still unpeeling this massive mess um, that the industries have created. So, yeah. It, you know what, microplastics are really frustrating because it's something that if we couldn't identify a bottle before, how can you identify a little shard of something that's come off exactly. something that's potentially even a shard before that, um, not including the ones that the animals have already ingested. And that's what makes, kind of circling back to what we started chatting about near the beginning, it's what makes holding these companies accountable even more difficult. It's like 
is Coca-Cola, or should I say Nestle, which I think overruns that whole arch, are they responsible for the, the death of all these animals? Are they responsible for the pollution in the ocean that we haven't even fully understood the depths of? And I'm just circling out Nestle. There's a mammoth of other companies. Um, it's so, I'm going to sound like a whiny little dog, but it, it's really unfair. Like it's it's a really unethical business model. And there's lots of document when we we're talking about resources before, there's lots of documentaries out there that people can watch. And most people have a Netflix subscription. So there's, there's plenty of them. I think there's like Plastic Ocean or Blue Ocean and, uh, and a lot of it touch on the albatrosses, which is an, a, a horrific sight to literally cut open. Uh, I've seen yeah. fish cut open, albatross cut open, and you just see literally like a gunk of plastic or a bottle cap, one that hasn't even broken down yet. And you think how... Even if we took 100,000 people, I'm not sure how many people we can get on boats out there picking it up, it probably wouldn't be enough. And and I understand that f- from river streams, you mentioned rivers before, which I think is vital. A lot of plastic actually funnels through rivers. So, you know, should we start there or, or should we just stop at the top, which is the production of plastic? Um, so it's a really conflated issue. And the more I talk about it, and the more educated I get about it, it's almost the more frustrating it becomes. It's it's the worst thing. Most people educate themselves so they know and they know the solutions. But I, I really, it, it's something that's so gray and so complicated. It, If humans can solve this issue, I will have unlimited hope for humanity is the way I'll put it. Same here, same here. <laughs> that would be a miraculous thing for sure. And I think we do have to hold on to hope um, not just so that we can make it through to tomorrow, but that there are people, you know, including just, you know, normal everyday people who are engaging in solutions. And I think the more the awareness grows, um, we there's agitation for change right now and there's change happening now. Um, we need it to happen rapidly because, you know, the survival of humanity is at stake. And I know that sounds super dramatic, but it is literally the truth right now. And, you know, we see the toll of the climate crisis unfolding in front of us. We see the toll of plastic pollution. We see the toll of, of toxins um, everywhere and overdevelopment. And I mean, it's just the list goes on and on. And um, going back to my simple, innocent days as a teenager rehabilitating wildlife and then thinking, I'm just treating the symptoms of people's problems. Why am I doing this? Like, and, you know, animals die most of the time because it's like mm. the issues are that big. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to really harness that hope, but also like make sure that we're acting because it's like, it's not just like, who's going to do this for me? It's like, I need to actually do something too. And I think like, again, we don't have to be perfectionists, but being, having this awareness and, and knowledge is like, the first critical step. So if, if you're just new to this, please, please dive in. Um, you don't need to be like throwing on some boots and like running to a protest tomorrow, but you, you really should learn more about plastics and the toll that they have on all of us. Um, and yeah, I think the more that we connect to others as well, and I think community is a really big part of the plastics issue that I've come to like completely love and I have to say, like, for all the horrible news that I have to see and work through every day, I work with the best people and everyone from every, you know, group that's working uh, towards solutions, real solutions, by the way. um, Mm. They're really passionate and really genuine. And I think like that gives me a lot of of hope because it's like we have the best people working on this issue. And I know it. <laughs> I, I see right. them every day. That's so, really good to hear. Yeah. Um, but the more, the merrier. So please, please, everyone, <laughs> join us. <laughs> um, you touched on something saying real solutions. What is a fake solution? A solution that is uh, maybe one that's um, advertised by the plastics industry or, or pushed by the plastics right. industry and the petrochemical industry. So recycling, it's like a big one. Um, I'm not saying like, start just throwing out everything in your garbage can. Like that's not what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Um, It's, it's more that we need to really shift our values towards reuse, um, Mm. refill, repair, share. Sharing is a huge one. I tell people, I'm like, 
you don't even have to buy my book, go to the library. Like, (laughs) it's like, we don't need to always buy or consume or like get. And I think removing ourselves from that mindset is also a very important part of this, like move to, to solutions because without being too critical of people, because we're all humans and I, you know, I buy stuff too. I'm not (laughs) immune to this. Um, Like we do need to like think about what do we really care about? And when I was out on on the ocean, I missed my mom, my brother, my dog, my best friend. I didn't miss plastic or I didn't miss stuff. I was like not thinking about my cell phone, which I couldn't use out in the middle of the garbage patch. I wasn't thinking about like watching a movie or, or my car or whatever. It was like, the Mm. things that matter (laughs) and and living in the most simple conditions i mean this boat um i'm sure like those who read the book will be like oh yeah it was sounded like a really unpleasant ride but like it was the most rich experience of my life and we didn't even have a real toilet it was nine people sharing a bucket that we dumped overboard it was like that kind of living no shower for three weeks more than three weeks except for salt water that you could (laughs) dump on yourself it's like living in discomfort can be extremely gratifying um, when you know that your values are in the right place. And it was like a Mm -hmm. boat full of people who were out there to like seek the truth and, and who care about the planet and, um, and understand that simplicity is a really beautiful part of life. And also the silence of being out at sea and not always having a million things happening and plastic being this product that like we associate with like, being cheap, easy, and fast. And it's like, nothing good in life is cheap, easy, and fast. Let's think about that. Um, so yeah, that was a, another aspect of the learning experience for me was like really to embrace these values and challenge myself to, you know, just like kind of stay in that mindset, even being on land where it's much harder, because let me just tell you, we can't even leave our houses today without being advertised to. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in our homes, it's like, I want to watch something on the internet and add, <laughs> pop up like yeah. it's, it's really exhausting to be alive today. And I think taking a step back can be really, really helpful in lending perspective. hundred percent. I'm curious to know on this boat to handle water. Did you have like a salt water purifier? We had actually just, there's a really old school boat. It was speaking of reuse. It was built out of reused steel from a different boat in the 1960s which is pretty cool in Belgium. And then a bunch of Danish people bought it and like kind of shined it up. And that's, it was all steel, no plastic uh, and wood. So it was a really beautiful old boat called Christian Chavin. Um, and there were two big water tanks um, in the boat. So fresh water. And that was all the fresh water we had. So, awesome. yeah. All right. So many different ways we can take this now. So we've looked at government. We've looked at how we can affect as consumers and a big, a big, when I'm thinking of those two categories, given that we live in a capitalistic society, there's businesses. Now, businesses always or would have an effect on supply and demand. And so reducing their ability to purchase plastic will, at the end of the day, really affect the bottom or top line, should I say, of these petroleum companies. When you're, Are you ever having a conversation to different businesses saying, hey, why are you still buying plastic to give to your customers are you ever going out of your way to say something like that well I would say uh personally I have done it a few times but my organization plastic pollution coalition we invite businesses to kind of um commit themselves to these plastic free standards that they can become a business that is part of our coalition and there are different standards like the blue standard which is kind of a seal of approval for businesses that want to be known for being sustainable and that spans not only plastic free but other metrics that um help encourage these these good business practices and um plastic pollution coalition recently worked with yelp to create these standards that um you can find plastic free businesses now very easily and that's that's a new thing this is all you know cutting edge and um you know looking for shops that have refill and reuse and and different kinds of um websites or programs or apps that we can go to to like tap into like where can I find things that are plastic free or these businesses let's patronize this restaurant because they're showing that they have zero single use plastics like that's a new thing and it's um, a very encouraging thing and I think part of it is that 
you know, Plastic Pollution Coalition um, has appealed to uh, businesses. Surfrider has actually done a really great job too with um, kind of pushing uh, restaurants to go plastic free um, and different businesses too, but primarily restaurants in that case. But um, it's really, it's almost like if you're not trying to do this now, you're a little lame. I feel like like it's the public Uncool. consciousness has shifted it. Yeah, you're you're not cool if you're if you're still using plastics. So um, the shift is happening. I think the biggest challenge are these like industrial businesses because it's much easier to go into a mom and pop mm. shop and have a conversation. And most people are well meaning. Who is <laughs> running these? evil corporations that's what we need to understand like who has these horrible values that wants to keep making this like insane amount of money um because most people once they learn about the issue um you know again like plastic pollution coalition or surf rider going into a restaurant saying hey like look at these facts and look at the alternatives and here's a guide for how you can actually go plastic free there's a plastic free eateries page on the website um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition website, which is an amazing resource. And it's like creating these resources and sharing these resources um, shows that it's possible. It's easy. And yet the industries do not want that to happen. So we have to address this mismatch. Mm. I, I like how there's so many different solutions out there. And you're right, going to a mom and pop shop, that's so easy. Even, even I <clears throat> say it at cafe sometimes and Fortunately, my fiance is the same. Otherwise, I'd embarrass anyone else with me saying, why are you guys still using plastic straws? Like, what is it? Is it the fact that you don't want to pay one cent extra per straw to get a plastic straw or actually just don't give it to someone unless they ask? Like, go figure. Because sometimes the, the heartbreaking thing about all this, and I think you'll experience the same or you have experienced the same is when you're, you're educated about the plastic, you're aware of the issue that's coming with plastic. And then you go sit down and someone gives you plastic. Yes. And you're like, what? And you, you you kick yourself for a second. You're like, I did not think to ask for a plastic straw with this or plastic fork with this. Like I'm sitting down here at your cafe. Like I want, I want stainless steel. I want ceramic. And then that's the worst. When you know right. it all, when you understand, or not, not it all, we'll never know it all. But when you understand <laughs> and then you still cop it. So I think that's a good the reason I say that is because like, I don't think I'm the most educated person and like, I, you're definitely an expert in the field, but I'd say we're never going to know it all, but people like us still succumb to these issues. So I wanted to highlight again, something you mentioned earlier, which is it's not about being perfect. Right. Um, and it's about just doing the best we can. Cause if we had the whole population just doing the best we can, I'm sure we'd have a huge head start on this issue. Completely. Thank you for, for pointing that out too. And and thank you for, and your fiance for advocating for plastic free. <laughs> it's awesome. Got to do it. Um, yeah. Now, look, you've mentioned your book a few times. It's called Thicker Than Water. I'm guessing that that title comes from the soupy ocean that is literally looks like water, but it's it's got thicker things in there. Is that yeah. where <laughs> kind of right? I'm on the ball with that. You're on. You're right on target, and also nodding to the um, social aspect and and needing to come together as humanity and really um, look at what we're we're facing um, and realizing that this is happening because certain people want it to happen, hmm. but the, the public needs to come together. And I think we are really strong, um, but it is about getting that knowledge out there and and these stories that are so important. Hundred percent. So anyone who wants to get that book can, I'm guessing, go to the go to their library to rent it out off the Amazon, most local bookstores, and any of that. Am I missing some other avenue there? I have a whole list actually on my website um, on the Thicker Than Water page, so you can find libraries, international options, indie bookstores, black owned bookstores, U.S. bookstores. I mean, you name it. I tried to make it as accessible as possible. <laughs> awesome. And uh, yeah. Thank you for letting me plug it. No, that's all right. I'll leave all the links in the show notes. So if someone wants to educate themselves and I'll also leave the plastic um, coalition, I, I forgot the actual name of it, the one that you're working with. I'll leave all that linked in the show notes. So if someone wants to educate themselves further, because as much as we dive into 
for an hour. This is a conversation and an issue that can go on for decades, essentially. Um, so we've covered a lot in, in this 60 minutes. We've covered everything from microplastics to plastic in our home to the way it affects the environment, health, animals. And there's a lot of different ways you can take this. But the way I want to end this conversation is actually just with your words of wisdom. And that could be about something that we've talked about today or something you'd like to add potentially irrelevant to this conversation. But I wanted to give you the platform for one to two minutes to speak your mind. Erica, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to say when you're, if you're interested in being a part of the solutions, the real solutions that we need, um, and this is something that I learned from X Expedition, another group that I've sailed with, um, all female sailing trip around the world. I sailed leg two of that trip from the Azores to Antigua. So prefacing with that, thank you, X Expedition. Um, but a really great and very useful tool that they introduced was to focus on asking yourself, what is your superpower? And so if I'm looking at myself, I would say my superpower is communications. Maybe someone else's superpower is being a teacher or maybe making art, or maybe it's you know making a plastic-free business. So there are so many ways that each of us can kind of tap into our strengths um, and really feel truly empowered because it can be so discouraging to be you know, making the switch to reusables and yet your neighbor is driving down the street and you see that their car is full of balloons or, you know, you're going to a, a cafe and you sit down and you're about to say no straw. And then before you can say anything, there's a big cup, plastic cup with a straw on your table and you're like about to rip your hair out. So <laughs> just focus on what you really love to do and what you're good at doing. And, um, and know that there are many, many people, there's a huge community out there of people who care and who are there to support you. And, um, you know, focusing also on like taking care of yourself and your mental health, because we do live in a really difficult world. And um, it's not always easy to, to keep that hope going and to keep the solutions moving forward. But um, again, tapping into to what you're good at is a really great way to get involved. Yes. Use your superpower to the best of your ability. That is incredible. What a lovely way to end this conversation. I want to put a cherry on top and just thank you for your time today, Erica. And thank you for all the work you do. I know with this issue of plastic, I'm sure if someone's listened the whole way through, they really have started to understand the scope of how really big and systemic this issue is. And it's not something we can tackle with one person doing it. We need lots of Erica's doing their thing. And the the role you play is crucial, you know, educating the masses. You're doing your writing, your science, the book. That's all part of the solution. So I thank you for putting yourself out there and devoting a certain portion of your life to educating people on how we can tackle this issue, which in turn helps the environment we live in, which is incredible. And that's exactly what I want and what everyone should want really. So thank you again for all the work you do in the space of tackling this issue of plastic. And thank you again for your time today to spread your wisdom and we'll chat next time. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you for all that you do to amplify these important stories and for giving me a platform. And it was so great to meet you. You're such a cool guy. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome to the end of the episode. Thank you for listening the whole way through. I really appreciate that you lended us your ears and maybe even your eyes for this whole hour long conversation. Thank you again to Erica for coming on and sharing your wisdom. I'm sure, uh, well, I definitely did and I'm sure the whole community appreciated it and your time. If you wanted to connect with her, I'll leave all the links to do so in the show notes below. And while you're there, make sure you're following us on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, all the amazing social media stuff um, that does go up for especially those visually inclined. But Instagram is a great place where I post carousels and reels to further look at this issue, especially when it comes to plastic, as that is a very personal passion of mine. But with all that being said, I will see you on next week's episode. In the meantime, stay happy, eat plants, peace.